No questions. Then let's begin with our lesson this morning. Five things every Christian should know. Has anyone ever told you? Uh, I've been working on the idea of this lesson for quite some time, knowing that there's a lot of things that uh, may be very simple, or not simple, but rather basic, that we've covered in the past, that we've not covered in a while. And I thought, we need to cover some of these things again. And I think it also fits on the coattails of last week's lesson, which is um, maybe a, a little bit more academic or a, a little bit more uh, non-traditional non, uh, as far as a weekly lesson. Um, these are things that we ought to pay attention to every week in one sort of another, personally, if not as a church. And so we learn as we study the Bible and as we learn what God's will is and learn how to live according to the Spirit and um, what to expect about God's wor uh, what God is doing, that there are some things that Christians need to know and that they simply don't. And I think this is a problem for why Christians can't seem to get past their initial experience of salvation. And I say that on purpose. They have an experience that they think is salvation, and then they don't know what to do from there. Um, and it's because they don't know these things. One good way for you then to perhaps minister to people, to evangelize, would be to pose the question to your Christian friends. Has anyone ever told you about that? Do you understand this? Maybe some of you are asking these questions. Like, you know, well, how do I understand this? Well, this is, this is where the lesson's coming from, okay? Has anyone ever told you? Because we as Christians need to know that. And so I'm making a big assumption here outright that we're all... Christians, right? That's a big assumption. Um, so I put on the top of the outline there, before point one, because there's got to be five, that's what I put on there, that uh, there are some things we already know as Christians. So this is to Christians, things that you should know. But you're not a Christian at all if you don't know that the Lord Jesus Christ is your God and Savior. If you don't know the gospel, the grace of God, you simply are not a Christian. That's what it means to be one. And so that's at the outset to understand Colossians 2, 3, that Jesus, the man who walked the planet 2,000 years ago, was not just a man, but God manifest in the flesh, right? He was risen from the dead to be Lord of all, and you, are, you have the opportunity to be complete in him. He's not only God manifest in the flesh, but your Savior. And so when it comes to your tribulations, trials, sins, misgivings, failures, he is the one you turn to for salvation. Um, then you're not really a Christian, are you? Right? That's what it means to be a Christian, that you understand your sin and need for the Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Okay? Uh, Colossians 2, verse 9 says, He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Titus 2, 13 says, He's the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in John 5, 23, Jesus says, As you honor the Father, you have to honor the Son. And so, we worship God in Jesus Christ. We worship the Trinity. We worship Jesus as our Lord and Savior, okay? And this is what it means to be a Christian. But that's not all that is required to be a Christian, so know that. Of course, how did he save you is the message, and how he saved you is the gospel, the grace of God. And so if you know, and many people do, that Jesus is Lord, or he's Savior, or he's God manifest in the flesh, and you do not understand that you're saved by his finished work on the cross, done for you, when you didn't deserve it, when you didn't ask for it, when you could never do what that accomplished, then it's questionable whether or not you're actually saved or not, because salvation comes through Christ and the gospel of him, the gospel of Christ, uh, which is his work on the cross. The gospel of the grace of God is nothing you do. It's what Christ did. He did everything. Okay? You uh, bring sin to the table, and sin deserves death. Christ died the death. Right? He rose from the dead when you had no power to do such a thing. And based on his death and resurrection, you can receive by his offer of, of, of that salvation eternal life because he lives forever okay and so that's the first thing on the table that we got to get clear and so you might if you don't know if someone understands that sort of thing which means you don't know if they're really saved or not you might ask them has anyone ever told you that the gospel is nothing you do but what christ did because that, that's also a big misunderstanding right some people think well the gospel is i have the opportunity to serve the lord you're never going to do it right. <laughs> you're never going to be able to be perfect where God grants you acceptance. Uh, you're going to need God to do it for you in the person of Jesus Christ, death on the, on the cross and his resurrection. So it's a good way to approach this. Anyone ever told you about that? Has anyone ever told you that Jesus is actually God is something interesting to ask your Christian friends who seem to never pay attention to that much anymore. It's kind of a historical idea and it's kind of been forgotten. He is God and Savior. Okay. So getting into the five things every Christian should know. Let's take that assumption that now you've heard the gospel, you believe you're saved, you understand what it is to be a Christian. Um, but how, 
Has anyone ever told you how to grow as a Christian? That's the first thing that you need to know. How to grow. How to study the Bible. You need to know how it is you hear God's voice. Which sounds very charismatic of me, right? But this is what everyone's asking. How do I hear God speaking to me? The answer is in the Bible, right? In the Bible, read literally, rightly divided. It's how you hear God's voice to you, right? Uh, how do you hear God speaking to you? The Bible. That's how you hear that. You're going to grow in your faith when you hear the words of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God is this book, right? It's not in dreams and in visions and everything else. It's in this book, inspired and preserved for you. And so you need to know, every Christian needs to know, how to grow, how to study the Bible. Because it's how you hear God's voice. It's the words of God right here. And Christians become very loose in talking about God speaking to them outside this book. Because of that, people discount and diminish the, the impact that this book has, the complete and full and perfect word of God to us as the church, okay? And so we need to acknowledge that. Something you need to know. Many of you say, well, I knew that already. Well, great. This, I'm just talking about things every Christian should know. So you can minister to your friends and say, has anyone ever told you how to grow as a Christian? Because maybe they don't know how to grow their faith. Well, faith comes by hearing the word of God. That doesn't mean you sit around and hope that he talks to you. It means you have to read the book, right? You've got to study which raises another question, how do you study, right? We talk a lot about that here. How do you actually use the thing? Uh, the Bible's not all written to or about you. You know, you're not going to grow if you think everything in this book's written about you because you're going to apply things to you that aren't applicable to you, and you'll be going in circles, right? Can you notice Christians getting stuck here? You see, every Christian needs to know this. If we don't have Christians growing, we have a bunch of Christian babies, right? And this is a big problem, I think, in the church. When people are saved, if they're saved, they stay immature and babies because they don't know this. How do you grow? How do I eat is the first thing that Pam and I are trying to teach our child. Right? How do you eat? You know, God gave a mechanism for him to eat initially, and then you know, he's got to eat by himself. So I buy him a little rubber spoon, and you've got to feed yourself, son. He's poking himself in the eye. And this is what Christians do. Right? Christians don't know how to grow. They don't know how to eat. They'll sit and listen to the pastor preach, and that's, that's one way. Right? But how do they eat on their own? I mean, this is only an hour. Some places, 30 minutes, right? How do you eat on your own? And they take the Bible and they're poking themselves in the eye. They don't know what to do with it, right? They, they, don't, they haven't figured out how to use this thing, right? So it's very important every Christian how to do this. 2 Timothy 2.15 says that you need to study to show yourself approved unto God. The emphasis not on the study right now, but on the yourself, right? Thyself approved unto God. Uh, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We talk about that like a slogan, but simply, what that means is simply you need to be able to discern, to, to discern the, the word of truth and what is applicable when and to who. Right? That's what that means. James 1.1, 1, 1, it says, James was writing to the 12 tribes of Israel. A very simple example of that not being to you unless you think you're one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Right? These are just very simple things and a very simple example that you need to learn how to use this book. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 may be a more controversial passage than James 1, verse 1. But you may have heard this, not knowing you have. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Have you heard this one? You're a nation. Anyone here think they're God's nation? It's taught frequently. 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen generation. Every generation thinks that. Right? Right around when you hit, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, you think, we're the chosen generation. And then you learn 20 years later, no, we weren't. <laughs> uh, this is how it happens, you know, since the Jesus. Uh, but 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And people look at that, and they, they like some of those descriptions, don't like other ones, don't understand other ones. You know, theologians have taught for centuries that uh, in the New Testament, we're all priests. You heard the priesthood of all believers? Where do they get that from? That verse they think Peter's talking to them, and they say, you're a royal priesthood. Well, who's he talking to? Believers? So, we're all priests, apparently. The question would be, priests to who, exactly? Priests are people that represent humanity to God. Um, who does that for you? Christ? <laughs> uh, you don't need anybody else but Christ. You don't need me or anyone else, and no one else needs you to represent them to God. They need Christ, right? The royal priesthood goes all the way back to Exodus and all the way back to Abraham where God promised Israel would be a nation of priests. The question of to who, answer being the other nations, right? The body of Christ today, the church is not made up of a singular nation and thus the description of a holy nation wouldn't really apply unless you're talking a very metaphorical sense. Like, 
What Christian tribe are you from? You ever heard that one? George Barna talks about that all the time. Different Christian tribes. What they mean is denominations, right? What faith history are you from, you know? What Christian tribe are you from? When the Bible mentions tribes, it literally means a family, a tribe in Israel. So there are 12 families, 12 tribes from 12 sons from Jacob, right? From uh, way back in the Old Testament. First Peter 2 verse 9, though people don't read it that way, they use this verse to say, well, you see, the church today is what the Old Testament was talking about. Okay. And so what I'm describing right now is a necessity to rightly divide the Hebrew apostles and the apostles of the 12, uh, 12 tribes and the writings to the 12 tribes and God's purpose to the 12 tribes right, from what God write, writes and gives to the church. Right? The need for right division. Uh, the need for understanding how to study this book. And that's the beginning of how to study it. Now, we've talked about that many times here, right, rightly dividing the word of truth. And many of you say, yeah, I agree with that. We need to rightly divide. But that's just the beginning, you know. That just uh, allows you and... and when we draw charts and we talk about right division, that is simply a way to get you to understand where the spoon is at. That's it. This is the bowl right here. You know, the, the armchair is not what you eat. You eat what's in the bowl, right? That, that's all that is, right division. Your food is here, not over here, right? But that's just the beginning. Because how do you extract the material? How do you get it in your mouth? How do you get the good stuff, right? That's another thing altogether. This is included in this thing Christians need to know. You need to realize that all Scripture is profitable, right? And this is always, people oppose us with that sort of idea, and it's not an opposition, because Paul wrote it. You need all the Scripture. You know, so it, it, it takes a, a little bit past baby knowledge to understand that what you eat is in this bowl, and the baby's going, I want what's in the fridge. And yeah, all food is profitable to you, but you know, this is what you're eating now, right? But it, it takes an adult to understand this. Can't eat everything. But all scripture is profitable for you, the Bible says, um, for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. So you need to learn, we need to understand how we take application from the Bible, even though it's not talking to you. How do you do that? Because if you don't, you're going to be missing some things that you really need, because all of scripture is profitable, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works, right? And so, what do Christians need to know? Every Christian needs to know how to grow and study the God's Word. Not just that it is God's Word, not just I need it, I need it as food, but also how to rightly divide it, and then how to apply it, whether it's talking to you or not. Right? We've talked before and had lessons on the three Bible applications, and we, we, we are starting to practice this now in our ambassador's workshop, uh, where we meet together and we go through this exercise of applying passages from the Bible in these three ways. Historical, which means we take the Bible literally. When it says Galatia or it says a nation, it means a nation. It means Galatia. And we, we try to figure those things out. And it describes people, places, and things, and God. And we learn about that in any page of Scripture, right? And so we studied God and Jesus and who he was, his nature, the last couple Sundays. And we went all over the Bible to learn this, right? Because it's not that we only learn about Jesus from Paul, right? And so we learn about people, places, and things throughout. It's historically true. There's a spiritual application in which we're asking ourselves, um, what, what can I learn from this that is morally good or morally bad, right? And we can ask that question of any passage in Scripture. And we can learn from Moses or Daniel to trust God, which is a very good moral teaching, right? But what God was doing with Daniel, specifically in instructing him to do, was different than what God's doing to you. The fact that Daniel had a certain diet was because he was a Jew where God required him not to eat certain things. And so now there's a Daniel diet plan, and Christians are going, well, more godly eating this plan or not. But you're not under that diet menu. Paul says, I'm on the Pauline diet plan, which means you can eat anything if you say thanks over it. Right? <laughs> you say, and it shows. <laughs> My wife keeps bringing up to me the proverb, which I told her first, quite frankly, that uh, God loves a just weight. <laughs> and Proverbs. Uh, it's talking about money there, of course, but... We're applying it to people. But anyway, um, that's off topic. The, the spiritual moral application of that proverb would be it's a good thing that things be balanced. You know, it's a good thing that we trust God. It's a good thing that we not be fearful of the circumstance. These are all good morals, right? But when we're asking the question, what is God doing with you today? And what does God require you to respond back to him? Now we're delving into the third application, which is doctrinal or dispensational. What are these specific instructions God has told you to do? How he said he's operating with you, like with the church today, and how does he expect you to respond, right? When he told Israel to go to Babylon and don't come back to the land for 70 years, that wasn't to you, right? You don't have to go to Babylon for 70 years. 
and you don't have your own personal Babylon, and you're not Israel, none of that. Right? So we can learn a spiritual moral truth from Israel's history, but the instructions back there were for them, not for us. Okay? And thus we find our instructions in the epistles of Paul. Thus, where we result when we write by the word of truth. So, did I sum that up nicely? How to grow is necessary for Christians. You cannot grow without understanding this. You need this book to grow. You need to understand how to use it to grow. You need to know how to apply it to grow. Second thing every Christian needs to know is what God wants you to do, which is you recognize that third application of Scripture, right? Dispensational, doctrinal, the question, what is God doing? What does God want me to do? This is something every Christian should know. And ironically, it's something a lot of Christians have problems with. They want to know God's will for their life, right? Or another way said, I want to know what Christ wants me to do. What does God want me to do? I want to follow the Lord, right? Well, look at Ephesians 5.17. In Ephesians 5.17, Paul says something here, which I've mentioned before. We've talked about the will of the Lord many times. There's a whole section on the website, but we need to remind ourselves that there are some things more important than others. We have question and answers uh, every Sunday morning. We had some great conversation this morning, and we get into questions that, you know, probably won't preach a lesson on for the next five years, ten years, you know, I don't know. But these are good things to study and good things to learn. But there are other things more important, which is why they don't always come up when we teach lessons, because there are things that we need to lay these foundation stones first. And th this is one of those things. What God wants you to do, you can't do anything for the Lord unless you know what he wants you to do. That sounds obvious until you realize that there are Christians saying they're doing things for the Lord and you ask them, what is God's will for you? And they go, I don't know. Which means you're not doing the will of the Lord. I mean, it's impossible for you to do what God's will is for you if you don't know what it is. I mean, maybe you're blindly doing it accidentally, but if you don't know what it is, how do you know you're doing it, right? And Christians deceive themselves, and they, they say, even though I'm ignorant of it, and I'm waiting for him to give me a clear revelation of his will, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway, and then I'm going to call that the will of the Lord. Have you ever been a participant in that sort of practice? I've done it. Maybe I'm the only one, where it's like, I want to do the will of the Lord, and I'm going to do what I think is best, and then I'm going to look back and go, that must have been God's will. No, that's what I thought was best. I admitted my ignorance of the will of God, so I can't blame God for my choices, you say. But the Bible does reveal God's will. That's what I'm trying to say. Every Christian does need to know his will, and the Bible reveals it. Ephesians 5.17 says, Be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. If you don't know the will of the Lord, you're unwise. And that's okay to admit, Okay. Because when you admit you're unwise, you're then able to grow. When you say that I'm wise and you really are not, you're deceiving yourself. And that's the definition of stupidity. Right? You won't grow at all. You think you know something and you really don't. What do you call that? Right? Better you admit that I don't know, which is a great answer, by the way. Young people, old, doesn't matter. It benefits us all to say, I don't know. And then you're able then to learn. And then you know. You see? You'll never learn when you say, I know that, and never try to learn that which you think you know and you don't. Does that make sense? This is, this is very applicable to the will of the Lord. Because until you actually know it from Scripture, which is how you hear God's voice, remember? You don't know it. Just admit it and study it. Right? Find it out. You say, well, I've been studying God's word for years trying to find the will of the Lord. Well, let me help you out because it's here. Very plain and clear. Look at Ephesians 1 verse 9. Here's the will of the Lord for you. In fact, the will of the Lord for all things. This is God's will for eternity, is what this is. This is the big picture first, right? It is 1, 9. He hath made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. One point we made at a seminar years ago was that the will of the Lord is the Lord's will. Again, very obvious. But when it comes to this question, people really uh, you know, leave obviousness uh, and reason, but um, the will of the Lord is his, not yours. It's amazing how many times Christians want God's will to be their own and that don't want to confess it that way, right? I'm looking for God's will in my life. Well, where are you looking for it for at? Well, I'm looking for it in all the things that please me. Maybe the Lord wants me, the Lord wants me to do what I like doing. This is what they are really doing and don't say. Because I have a natural ability and talent and interest in this. That must be God's will. No, that's your will, right? You got to distinguish this. 
God has his own plan he's doing, you know. God's will is in verse 10. It's according to his purpose and his good pleasure. The question we ought to be asking is not what you're interested in, but what's God interested in. That will get you closer to God's will. Well, God's interested in making me happy. You see, that, that's the circle you get in, right? God loves me, so it's back at me again. No, no, it's always with God. Okay, in verse 10, in, this, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And you're going, boring, not interested to me, right? Well, that, that's some self-soul reflection there that's got to go on. Because God's eternal purpose that he's been working on since Genesis and before, and will be working on until the dispensation and the fullness of times, is that all things be brought together in Christ. This is, it's very simple. That's what he's doing. Everything be in Christ. You may be saying, well, what does that mean? Good question. Now you're exploring God's will, right? But that's his purpose, that all things be in Christ. All right? Move on to 1 Timothy 2. God's will is you live a quiet, peaceable life. Quiet, peaceful life. Does that um, interest anybody? Some of us are interested in that, even uh, apart from searching God's will. The world is seeking for quiet and peace often. It's amazing how many times people seek for quiet and peace amidst God's creation and not man's. Isn't it fascinating? I'm at a giant park in New York City. Why is that? I want to get away from the city. Why do I need to get away for it, from it for? The city doesn't bring you peace? Doesn't bring you quiet? No. Then why did you build it? <laughs> it's a good question to ask. You know, money is obviously the answer and convenience and all that. First Timothy 2, verse um, 1, we should pray for those who do that sort of thing. Um, Give intercession, supplications, and prayers, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God. When you're asking the question, what does God want? That's one thing he wants right there, isn't it? Quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. This is good and acceptable to God, our Savior. Right? Verse 4, who will have all men to be saved. You see, God wants you to have peace and life and joy and all the rest of it. He wants all men to be saved. God's will, then, is that souls be saved. And it goes on to say, and come to a knowledge of the truth. What's God's will for me? He wants you to live a quiet and peaceful life. He wants you to be in Christ, which we're going to find quiet and peace. He wants you to have uh, uh, salvation, in verse 4. He wants you to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what he wants. Now, some of that stuff takes work. Other stuff doesn't. Salvation doesn't take your work at all. We have to trust the gospel of Christ. You have to have faith and trust what he did for you. You have to accept that you're the sinner that needed his salvation. In verse 4, coming to knowledge of the truth is a little more work. Because this book contains what God is telling you about truth, and you've got to learn it. Right? That's what God wants. So why is number one something Christians should know, how to study the Bible? Because number two, God's will is that you come to knowledge of the truth. That's part of it. Okay? We all have to have some Bible understanding, and it's amazing how wise the Scripture makes simple people. You say, well, I can't study that stuff. I'm not a student. I'm not a scholar. You don't have to be. The Bibles are written for scholars and that sort of business. It, it says over and over again that simple people are made wise by the wisdom of God through the understanding of this book. It can be easily understood. Okay. So verse 22, 4 talks about God's will. Look at Ephesians 3, 8, 9, and 10. Did you know that God's will is that all men would see, would understand, would hear this fellowship of the mystery. You say, fellowship of what? This fellowship with Christ, the mystery of God's will, that everything be in Christ, and what that means. This fellowship of the mystery. He wants all men to see. Ephesians 3, verse 9, 8 and 9. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Not the unsearchable riches of technology or the world society or good financial investments, but of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So this fellowship of the mystery is what we're today to preach. If you're looking for a great commission, that's where it is right there. To make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. To see men saved and come to a knowledge of truth. Right there. That's what he wants. Okay? That may mean what you're doing to earn a living and what you're doing because it's interesting to you and entertaining to you may need to incorporate to some degree this, right? Maybe some of that money you earn needs to go to letting this happen. Maybe some of that time that you had needs to go to coming to a knowledge of the truth or seeing souls saved, right? This is God's will for you. 
The problem, of course, at this point is everyone says that this, this seems very generic. Aren't there pastors that do that? Well, this is for everybody, you understand. This is God's will for all of us, not just preachers, teachers, and this sort of thing. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. What is God's will? This is the will of God. That's a good verse to go to. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. In verse 1, he talks about the Lord Jesus Christ giving commandments in verse 2. For this is the will of God, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, that you should, even your sanctification is what it says, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You see, we were born into these vessels, right? These bodies, these, this place, this existence. And one of the things that God would want you to do is know how to operate with this thing that you have, right? Know how to possess your vessel. That's God's will, which is what sanctification means. Sanctification means to be set apart for God's purpose, right? He created you to function. Even though there's sin in you and around you, he created humanity to function. And when you get saved by God's grace, he can deal with your sin. And now you need to learn how to possess the vessel you have in honor, not in dishonor, in sanctification, not like everyone else. This is something that we naturally yearn for, by the way. You know, everyone does not... We have a, a natural tendency, rather, in our culture these days, not to go along with the crowd, right? To be distinct. And what's amazing, as older people look at younger people, they're all looking to be distinct. By being distinct simply means they're different than their parents, because they're all the same. They all look the same, different than their parents. Which is why sociologists can look at generations and say, Generation X is like this, and Generation Y is like this, and Generation Z is like this. There's common traits among generations who are trying to be different than who? Not each other. From the previous generation. That's all. There's responding to the previous generation, which in itself, if you look at one or two hundred years, you see cycles, right? There's a rebellious generation, there's another generation. It's just kind of a cycle. So yeah, you're just like your grandpa's granddaddy. Yep. No different. There's nothing new under the sun. This is why you have to study of sociology and these sort of things. But first Thessalonians 4, God would have us learn how to possess our vessel in sanctification. This is truly a righteous distinction. And you say, well, this is no different. I mean, wouldn't we all be the same if we're all sanctified? Yes, true, but we'd all be the same living quiet, peaceful lives in righteousness, joy, and honor. This is great. So apart from any other sort of distinction you'd like to make, whether it be fashion or music or what have you, this is actually a beneficial one for us all, right? And uh, it will set you apart from the world. So this is God's will right there. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Anybody have a problem with that? Does anybody say rejoicing forevermore is not a good thing? Right? Surely God doesn't know what he's talking about and God's word cannot be true. There's nothing true in this book filled with lies and myths. Rejoice evermore. I can't do that. That's horrible. I'd rather be miserable and pout forevermore. Which is, yeah, that's accurate. But if you really know what joy is, happiness is, rejoice evermore, that's a pretty good command, isn't it? Verse 17, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What is your will for me, Lord? Open the book, and he told you. So step one, right? How do you grow and how do you study? Well, you've got to open the book, you've got to believe it, you've got to read it, you've got to study it. You've got to know where to find it. If you're looking for God's will in Deuteronomy, it's going to be harder. See, I, I came to, notice all these were Pauline verses. I came here because I knew that's what God was telling us to do. And I found these verses talking about the will of God for us. So I already had that prepared, you know, but... I'm helping you just by giving you the cheat sheet. Verse 17 and 18, everything give thanks. Can you do that? Can you pray without ceasing, giving thanks to God for the things he's done, he's given to you that you never created? Thank God for taste buds and everything else. This is great. Yeah. And in everything give thanks. Well, even in the tribulation, the suffering, and the pain, give thanks to God for his grace and his salvation. The strength that he provides, the spiritual inner strength. And so in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. Not for everything, in everything, right? And so this is the will of God. It's not hard to learn that once you now have the verses. So now I give them to you, you have no excuse to say, I don't know what God's will is. Something every Christian should know. Number three, how to live. I mean, salvation, study, prayer, thanksgiving, sanctification. You know, what does that actually look like? How do I actually live? What's... Life like a Christian, how is that different than life not like a Christian? It's just a good question that our culture and the church try, is trying to answer. What's it, what's it look like to be a Christian in this culture? What's it look like to be a Christian in this environment? How are we distinct? 
Or to put it another way, how do you walk in the Spirit? That's what it means to live as a Christian. Or otherwise known as, and I put some scriptural terminologies here, the crucified life. You ever heard that terminology? How do you live the crucified life, which means to live as Christ? Or how do you live the resurrected life, which means to live as Christ? How do you live the spiritual life, life in the Spirit, which is to live with the Spirit of Christ? Or how do you walk by faith, as 2 Corinthians says in verse 5? Not by sight, by faith. It's all describing the same thing, you understand, how we live and walk. Salvation's a moment. You believe the gospel, you trust it. Great. Learning God's will, I just told you. I mean, check that mark off the list, you know. Got it. Know God's will, right? Now, how do you live? Now, you walk every day. How do you do that? What does it mean to be sanctified? Right? Walking after the Spirit, walking the worthy walk, walking by grace. These are all terms that Paul uses and describes in many of his epistles. You can put them all under this heading of how do you live? Something Christians need to know. If Christians don't know how to live, then they are Christians saved by grace. They may even know some things because they've learned how to study the Bible, right? But don't know how to live. I mean, they're just, they know things and they're saved. What do you call that? Well, the Corinthians were like that quite a bit. They knew a lot of things and were saved. And they had a lot of life problems, right? And Christians need to know how to live. How to live as God intended by the Spirit, Right? Which means we need to understand some things, going back to study, but what we need to understand is that the life that we would have lived without salvation would have been different than the life that we're living now. Right? That's first on the table. Right? Namely, that your spirit has been quickened. Before you were saved, you did not concern yourself with spiritual things. Even the religiosity part of you was simply doing things that appeased your flesh religiously. When you were saved, it says in the Bible, Christ quickens your spirit, which was before dead. So your spirit can then understand and know the things of God. What are the things of God? God is love. God is joy. God is peace. God is righteousness. God is just. You can know those things when you are spiritually discerned. You're spiritually alive, okay? How are you supposed to walk then? That's different than how anyone else walks because we're all on the same planet with the same stores and everything else, the same Amazon, and you know, how am I supposed to walk differently? You walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. You have flesh, you have Spirit. The Bible tries to teach you how to discern this, okay? And it teaches you the difference. To be who you're supposed to be is what it means to live. To be who you are in Christ, that who you're supposed to be is in Christ. Who you're supposed to be, your position, your identity, your duty, the tools that God's given you. All of these things are spiritual, you understand, because he doesn't give you a nameplate in the mail once you become a Christian. You don't get a certificate from God. You're now a Christian, and you put that on the wall. Christian, you know. Some churches do that, right? They're trying to make it more, I don't know, official or something. But you need to understand the spiritual aspect of these things. Who are you supposed to be, Right? Because who you are is not just your body, is it? Who you are is not just your flesh. Who you are is not just your career. Who you are is not just your family background. Right? Or am I wrong about that? Is that all that you are? The scripture tells you who you are in Christ. Your inner man. Complete fulfillment. Right? Fulfillment is a spiritual thing. You understand this? It's easy to fulfill your body. You stuff some food down your, you know, food hole. <laughs> That's how you fulfill your body, but how do you fulfill yourself, right? Your soul. Well, that's something else. It's a spiritual thing. And the scripture speaks about that. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus said, Deuteronomy said, true of all scripture, right? Well, how do you do that? To know some things. How do you live? Well, live with the knowledge of God's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Some of you recognize those as the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5. Do you know them? I don't mean just memorize them. <laughs> I mean, do you actually experience them? Do you know them? You know what I mean? That's what it means to walk after the Spirit, is that your life is trying to attain or trying to produce the fruit of the Spirit. How do you do that, right? Something every Christian needs to know. If you don't know how to produce the fruit of the Spirit, then you, it won't happen, right? By accident, you know. To know these things, to know God's love, God's joy, God's peace, how God long suffers, how God is gentle, how God is good, how God is faithful, how God is meek and temperate. 
right? That's what that means, the fruit of the Spirit. To think on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praise. Again, some of you recognize that from Philippians 4. Just to think on these things, right? How to live, how to walk after the Spirit. Know what you're supposed to be, to know these things of God, to know, by the way, these are the deep things of God right here. To, to think on these things, things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praise. To have the mind of Christ about things excellent. And read Philippians 1 through 4, chapters 1 through 4, which is the whole book. Philippians, okay? And you'll learn about the mind of Christ, about how to discern things that are excellent, they're not more excellent than other things. Okay, and Paul has that discernment, and he says, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Okay, now, awesome motto and bookmark, uh, but if you don't know what it's talking about, this is a problem, right? Who says death is gain? I mean, this is kind of a weird, backward philosophy. You've you got to have the mind of Christ and think and understand some of these spiritual things, things that you don't see. When you're surrounded by bad circumstances, death and tragedy and everything else, how do you know how to walk by faith? Right? Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to walk with the mind of Christ toward others? How to glory in God? How to know the joy of the Lord? Some of these topics we'll probably cover this year a little bit because some of you have requested it. It's a good thing to study because every Christian needs to know this. These aren't trivial things. Right? If God promises you eternal glory and joy and love and peace, why don't you have it? It's a good question. Right? Every Christian needs to know how to walk in the Spirit. Or how to respond to sin, failure, condemnation, frustration, despair, tragedy, pain. Because the world is full of it. And your life will be too. And my life's been sunshine and roses until now, you know. Well, well, good for you. Good. It won't always be that way. Anyone get an amen who's lived a few years? And if you look at anyone else besides you, it may not be that way either. Maybe you can seclude yourself off from all the troubles of the world. But this world is broken. And it's filled with broken people, right? And it will affect you. How do you respond to these things? Well, you've got to know who you are. You've got to know the, the things of God working in your inner man. You've got to think on the things of God. You've got to have the mind of Christ so that when you're confronted with these horrible, terrible things, you'll respond godly, right? Otherwise, without those sorts of changes in your inner man and, un, and spiritual uh, understandings, you will not be able to respond godly at all, Right? You respond as your flesh responds, as tradition responds, as other people pressure you to respond. Godly behavior and responses come from the inner man with spiritual understanding, which is why Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1, before anything else, he prays that they would have wisdom and spiritual understanding. He's talking in Ephesians about how to live as a Christian, not in Ephesians how to be saved or even how to study the Bible, but not those basic things, but how to live as one. You need to have spiritual understanding. Okay. How do you respond with those things? The answer is with uh, salvation. You say, well, I'm already saved. Well, yeah, but it needs to be applied again. Because salvation is from sin and despair and failure and tribulation. So you have to apply that again. And when you are saved, it was by grace and faith. So you don't expect when you're applying that to your present situation, that suddenly the situation goes away. What you're expecting is that you are saved from it. You know, your spirit is strengthened. Forgiveness, we've talked about this last Tuesday, and we'll talk about it again. Forgiveness, a tool, a response to these sorts of evils. Comfort, grace, faith, hope, charity, these things. The greatest of these is charity, as Paul says, right? These are spiritual truths. Ask the world what it means to walk by hope and charity, and listen to the des desperate responses they get. And this is not, an, I'm not trying to create, you know, we're better than them type of thing. I'm just saying this is God's word that's superior. He gives you spiritual understanding so that you can understand things that are far surpassed any sort of vain hope humanity can create. You see, because the world can try to pretend to create love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and indeed they can have it for a bit, but it's not God's, which means it doesn't last forever. It doesn't come from a true source, an endless source, and it, it's not all-encompassing, Right? You ever wonder why the people who talk about being loving are hardly ever loving to Bible-believing fundamentalists? I mean, they, just, they don't love them. I thought you wanted to be loving to everybody. Why won't you tolerate us? <laughs> right? Well, there's one thing that's intolerable, and that's intolerance. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> you know, so I'm going to discern truth and error, right and wrong, and that's intolerable to you. It sounds like someone's being intolerant. It's not me. Right? You see, the world creates these things. The world wants to have love. How can you say you guys preach love and don't and call homosexuality a sin? 
They're just loving each other. God's love loves true and right things. Okay, it's not a true love to want to hurt someone else. And you say, that's not what they're loving each other for. Sin hurts. The reason why sin is sin is because it's bad. It hurts. It's wrong. It breaks things, right? In God's order and creation, right? The way he intended things to be. Recently, one of the, uh, 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 the confirmation hearings of a, a judge in America was asked by a senator, you know, do you think homosexuality is a sin? And I thought, whoa, what a great question. It's not because I knew the answer, yes, but that, that wasn't it. Because that's not how I would have answered. I would have said, yes, that's not how I would have said it. I would have said, what do you think is sin? What a great ministry opportunity. <laughs> what do you think is sin? Because you know what he thinks sin is? Probably very different than what the Bible describes it as. You see, if God is virtuous and true and loving and everything that is good, sin is things contrary to that, you see. That's what sin is. And so, yes, I think the best arrangement for the further reproduction of humanity and benefit for children everywhere is for a mother and a father to be there. That's what I believe. Right? Are you going to say that's wrong, Mr. Senator? <laughs> is that incorrect? To be mommies and daddies? Yes, that's horrible. <laughs> really? So, see, this is the real problem with sin. It's not that I'm looking at people and saying, we hate you. We're saying that there's righteousness and unrighteousness. There's things that are helpful, things that are hurtful. There's things that give life. There's things that give death. And God actually explains to us the secret behind all that and how we know the difference. Right? We're all looking for the same thing, glory. <laughs> We're looking for peace and love and everything else. And the explanation from God's word is that if you don't seek it this way, you won't ever get it. The, what, how you need to get it, you know. You'll never get the nutrients you need from eating junk food. It just won't happen. You say, well, that's not what I believe. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you believe. It's not going to happen. Moving on. Fourth thing every Christian should know. What is coming? What is coming? Christians should know that. Now, Christians love to spend time on what is coming. How many prophecy videos are on YouTube, really? How many prophecy charts and studies of the end times have Christians tried to do? They love to study what is coming. That's not what I'm talking about. The timing of events and when the rapture occurs and things like that. I'm talking about what is coming, just generally speaking, more specifically to you, which is judgment. Here I am, fire and brimstone. I'm here. It's not fire and brimstone, though. I'm just preaching judgment. What every Christian needs to know, and these are saved people in the body of Christ in this dispensation of grace, is that God will judge everyone, and yes, that means you. Some of you are going, wait a minute. I thought it was grace. Didn't Christ take his judgment for me on the cross? Yes, there's more than one judgment in the Bible, and Christ took the judgment of sin for you at the cross, by the cross, right? His work there. But the you will be judged before the Lord. This is clear from the scripture. Why does every Christian need to know that? Because it's going to happen, and you don't want to be caught with your socks down on that day. Right? Or whatever. You probably won't have your socks on that day. Well, they say you can't take it with you. So my, my socks won't go with me. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Look what Paul says about the judgment. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Does anyone else read that and go, what? What? wait a minute, I thought it was not by our works. You're saved not by your works, right? This judgment is not to determine whether or not you are saved or not. Okay, this judgment is determined what sort of works you did in the body of Christ. I mean, he saved you, put you into his body, made you a new creature, give you a position, a responsibility, and a duty, and the judgment is how well you did it. He said, be not unwise, but understand the will of the Lord. Well, if you show up on judgment day with Christ, and he's going, how'd you do it? He said, do what? A short conversation, won't it? <laughs> like, well, uh, wow. Um, the verse says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. I feel like that's a shameful answer on that day. How'd you do? Do what? Whoops. Maybe you at least ought to know. So that when he asked, how did you do? You should say, not enough. You know, <laughs> not as much as I should have. Right? right? That'd be a, a nice response, but you're going to face the Lord in judgment. Right? It'd be nice to know how, on what basis he's going to judge you. In verse 2 Corinthians 5, he says, whether the things be done in his body, good or bad things. Paul says, and... Well, maybe we should go to Romans 14 first. Romans 14, verse 10. 
We tend to forget this. We um, relish and glory as we should in salvation by grace and living the Christian life, which we should. And living the Christian life meaning like before you die, like now, right? But there's something that happens when you die. I mean, you were told this, hopefully, when you got saved, that you'd be facing judgment, which is why you needed Christ to save you. But just because you got saved doesn't mean you don't go to the judgment. It means simply that you don't go to hell in the judgment, right? Romans 14, verse 10 what dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's talking to Christians here. He's not saying, now that you're saved, you forget the judgment. Christians don't judge. God doesn't judge. Christ doesn't judge. He only judges bad people. Which of course, is all wrong thinking. <laughs> We're all sinners that need God's grace, right? But he's talking to Christians here and saying that you're not the judge. Who's the judge? In verse 10. This is a Bible translation question. It says Christ. Christ is the judge. Other translations say God. And you say, same thing. I get it. But there's a lot more people that agree with God than would agree with Christ. Because the only way Christ could be the judge is if he is God. Okay? Interesting note there. But it's just the seat of Christ. All right? Um, and we're all going to stand before it. Verse 11. As it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us, and who are you confessing to? In verse 10. Christ, Christ is God, right? Verse 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way, because we're all going to stand before Christ to be done of what sort of ministry. And so the, the, the idea here is that we're trying to help our brothers do good service to the Lord, not hinder them, not mock them and despise them, but to help them. So that on that day when they stand alone, they won't have to be as ashamed, Right? That's the charitable response. We don't say, well, you guys are condemned, you know, and go about our business. We're trying to help and edify one another. In verse 14, I know and am persuaded uh, by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of it. Well, he goes on to talk about the food and all that. But Romans 14, 10 through 12 talks about us all being accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and facing his judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Romans 14 says, let us not judge one another. He's not saying there that we should not learn how to judge. What he's saying is, you are not the judge. Right? It's a, judges aren't the only people that know the law. Attorneys know. Right? And if you knew, maybe you wouldn't break it. <laughs> right? And so there's laws. You break them. You go to court. You don't know them very well. You hire an attorney who knows them better than you. And you stand before a judge. See, the judge isn't the only one that knows the laws. Right? Now we're not under the law, we're under grace, but at the same time, the judgment that we'll face before Christ, Christ isn't the only one that knows the standard of judgment. We need to know. Right? We need to be able to judge a spiritual judgment. Paul says, he that is spiritual judges all things. But we're not anyone's judge. We just know how to do so. You see? We're not the one that gives the condemnation of the sentence or anything. We're not the one sitting there, they're not answering to us, and yet we need to have the spiritual knowledge, understanding, and discernment to say, how am I living? Right? And even maybe, how are they living? So that we could help them, not hurt them, right? First Corinthians 4 says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You see, Paul knows the basis, the criteria upon which God will judge. What's the criteria in verse 2? Jeopardy music? F faithfulness, right? It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Well, that he's telling you on what basis Christ will judge at the judgment seat. Right? How'd you do? Were you faithful? Right? And so only Christ could be the true judge of that, not anyone else. But you ought to be trying to live faithful. That's the basis there. In verse 3, with me it is a very small thing. By the way, if I can back up another verse here, being faithful to what in verse 1? The mysteries of Christ. Right? So there's doctrine there. But verse 3, with me it is a very small thing that I be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. He's talking about I'm not my own judge. Obviously, he reflects on himself and evaluates and judges in that way. Verse 4, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. He that judges me is the Lord. And that's the same judge of you. The Lord judges you. We're all going to face judgment. What's to come for you in the future, meaning after this life? Judgment. And you need to know that, because it's not that eternity begins when you die, it's that you've been saved now, eternity begins now, and when you die, you're actually going to face judgment for what's been done. So it's not that you die is the end of your life, it's, it is the end of your life here, but 
He'll be facing the Lord in judgment to see how, how it was lived. Okay? By grace through faith. Go back up to point three, right? Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Verse 5. I love that verse. He will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Has anybody been misunderstood? Has anyone had an intention that people interpret wrongly? That wasn't my intent. Like, you honestly said that? You know? Because this is man's judgment, Right? Okay, you guys weren't here for three weeks in January. Obviously, you're all, you know, scoundrels. We canceled, of course, obviously. But, uh, you know, this type of misjudgment that happens. And, and Paul says, God will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. The things you actually intended, he will know, which works in both ways. It means when you intended good, and it wasn't read or turned out that way. Or when you did something good, but didn't intend it really that way. <laughs> I mean, it works both ways, right? But better, your intentions always be good. But he makes manifest the counsels of the heart. And every man shall have praise of God. What's also interesting about the counsels of the heart business is that I've been thinking about this a little bit lately. I might, I might write something about it. About Christian role, role models. Anybody deem themselves a Christian role model? I, I, I don't. I, I don't know. But it, I, I hear on Christian radio, which I don't know if you listen to a lot. I don't a lot. But they, they bring out these role models. How do I know the role models? Because they tell me that they are. Right? And who are these people that are role models? They're athletes, politicians, business leaders, CEO, wealthy people who are Christian. You ever heard this? Well, look at this guy. He's a Christian, right? Look at this great athlete. He's a Christian. You hear this every, every year at the Super Bowl, right? This quarterback and that quarterback's a Christian, and the quarterback's the leader of the team. So if the Christian's the leader of the team, it's like a little church they're having out there, which isn't too far from the truth for most people's religion. <laughs> but... They say he's a Christian, and look how successful he is in life. He's wealthy, he's famous, he's powerful, and he's a Christian. And they say, what a great role model you are for younger Christians. And I'm going, no, 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 <laughs> no. Because that's not what it means to be a Christian. That's not how you live the Christian life. You're saying you're against sports? Not against sports. I'm simply saying the Christian life's not defined by sports, right? Who's a good Christian role model? Christians! <laughs> Who, yeah, you said they're Christians. Yeah, but Christians who live by the Spirit and do God's will and know God's will. I don't know if the surfer they interviewed two weeks ago really knew God's will. He said he was still looking for it, but he's really successful in life and thus deemed a role model for Christians. It seems like the role model ought to be, I mean, someone more like Christ, right? I mean, anyway, I'm getting on my, off my soapbox here, but when you talk about judgment here and talking about the counsels of the hearts being man manifest, I feel like there's going to be Christians who are faithful and who did the will of the Lord, who supported things, even without saying words, and supported things to do God's ministry, perform His will, seeing souls saved and saints edified, who get zero recognition. Zero. Right? They're silently doing God's will. Quiet, peaceable life, Right? And in glory, it'll be like, that guy got saved because you know, of the work he did. That guy got saved because of the work he did. And then the Christian surfer, they're going, and those guys all went to your mega church for what you did, but you know, they didn't really hear the gospel. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm getting at here? The quality of work is what's important. In 1 Corinthians 3, in verse oh, 12, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hand, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire. This is a judgment of fire upon believers, upon how they built. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Not how much it was. Not how grand it was in the eyes of the world. Not how well it looked. Right? Not, how, not how satisfying to the flesh it was. Not how much esteem the world gave this person. But rather, the sort of work. Is it work that actually lasts? Like convincing the atheist there's a God, but never telling him about Jesus. Not saved. Right? It takes a lot of work to do something like that. You end up with an unsaved person. <laughs> so you convinced him of theism, like Anthony Flew, who didn't ever confess or admit he believed Jesus Christ was a Savior. So, not an atheist. Hooray! In hell. Ooh. What sort of work are you doing? Okay? This is important. Seeing souls saved. 
Saints edified, thankful in everything. That's going to be the gold, silver, and precious stone that lasts, right? So we ought to, to know what that means. How do I build these things? And what I, is the work I'm doing, is it wood? Is it stubble? Is it frustration? Is it confusion? Is it division? Or is it things that last? Souls. <sighs> Moving on. The fifth thing every Christian should know. And this is going to be useful, hopefully. The greater glory of God. Now this is something that it doesn't take a genius in the Bible rightly divided in biblical application to understand. But it's something every Christian should know. And so I'm speaking to ourselves here, as well as Christians at large. We need to understand our hope, the greater glory, why we do the things that we do. It's not out of fear of the judgment, verse 4, even though we will be judged. It's not simply because our life now can be lived in a way God intended, even though that's part of it, live the spiritual life, crucified life, right? It's because there's greater glory to come. This life is not it, you understand. The thing that is most glorious, God has described, is yet to come, right? And you need to know this. Know what it means that the greater glory is to come. Know what it means, Romans 8, 18, that says the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in you. What glory? If you don't know what that is, you'll have zero motivation, right? I mean, you, you'll have willpower, and you'll try and try and try, but it's like, why, right? Because it may look like you're a total failure, even at doing God's will, Right? If the motivation is greater glory, that's what's going to happen, then there's nothing in this world that can stop you. You already know that's a doctrinal fact. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, Romans chapter 8. But when you understand Romans chapter 8, that there's a glory that surpasses anything you can ever attain or achieve here, the things you try to attain and achieve here really become very diminished. Right? That might help you orient your life more around the doing of God's will. There is a glory that surpasses anything you will ever be able to personally or collectively achieve. We have to get that truth in our minds. The world outright denies this. Okay? It denies it. This truth, the world denies it. So this sets Christians apart. The world says, you are wrong. In fact, they say Christians are wasting their lives studying the Bible, trying to convince people of their beliefs and their doctrinal truths and these spiritual things that they don't understand self admittedly because they say what you should be doing is spending your life and time and dedication to furthering technology, discovery, exploration, education, healthcare, all of these things. This is what the world needs. And as Christians, we go, yeah, we see those problems too. The world does need that, but there's something far greater than that, right, that the world needs. As a Christian, you believe that, and you need to know that from the Scripture. If you don't know what that is, you'll lose sight of it. You see, I think you're right. We need to be spending more money and effort and time on these things to help people in the world that does not include Christ, does not include the gospel, does not include eternal life. Right? We talk about those things because there's a greater glory that everyone can have when they trust the gospel. Right? The greater glory doesn't come to those who only know the will of the Lord, who only know how to study the Bible, who only know what is coming. The greater glory comes to all those who are saved. That was, you know, introduction, premise. Right? You get saved, you get glory. So all of these things that Christians should know is so that we would be better workmen so that we can see other people saved and they can have greater glory. When someone's on their deathbed in the hospital and all the modern technology has done all that it can do, they're still dying, right? And we need to have that health care, but they're still dying. Who helps them then? It's called palliative care, right? We'll just make them feel comfortable with the time they have left. Or give them a greater comfort for what they could have the moment they die. Glory, right? Christians know this. They should know this. I think they've forgotten this. And Christians think the greatest ministry they can do is helping people feel comfortable in this present evil world. And I mean, righteously comfortable. You know, like I just described in this situation, which would be a good thing, right? What about the spiritual truth and strength that used to exhibit from Christianity and Christians? That yes, we do what we do here to help people because of the love that God has shown us, but also we have a greater glory. And that's why we are able to sacrifice and do and give our lives charitably to these activities is because there's a greater glory. And we want people to know that greater glory, right? For that, that purpose and that sake. 2 Corinthians 10, 17 says, what have, you, what have you glory in? Glory in the Lord, right? And Christians kind of say that as a motto, kind of like, you know, be a Christian, glory in the Lord. That's not what that means. You know, be a Christian, you know, glory in the Lord. No, no it, it means that the things people glory in and, how many Super Bowls? Six Super Bowl wins? 
Th that's glorious, folks. <laughs> that's glorious. Is it six? Am I right? Yeah, six Super Bowl wins. I mean, it's a dynasty. It's, in the terms of football, it's football glory. I mean, th people give their lives and career for that sort of record, right? What Tom Brady said. You know, people, how much sweat and tears and blood and everything else they give to it. And am I saying it's wrong? I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's a greater glory than that because next year, new competition. Next year, they may lose. Let's hope, right? <laughs> next year, there's another chance to win or lose, right? But eternal glory is eternal glory, and it's far surpassing those sorts of things. You say, that's ultimate achievement. So what an amazing thing if Tom Brady became a Bible-believing Christian, so that on the pedestal of the Super Bowl, he can say, I'm a Christian, praise God. Well, that would be awesome. But that doesn't make him the Christian role model. That doesn't make him his life having fulfilled a Christian purpose. Do you know what I'm saying? That's not, that's not all that does. We praise God if they were saved and they are saved. We praise God for that. But the glory we glory in happens after this life is over. That's the glory we glory in. Not the things we do now in this life. That's the difference. We don't glory in the things of our flesh. We glory in the things of the Spirit. We don't glory in the things that do that do give us glory and joy and love now, we glory in the greater things that give us eternal love, joy, and peace from God. Right? What does it mean to glory in the Lord? It means we glory in all that He is, all that He gives, all that He does. Because people seek and do attain to a degree the things that here we describe we look for spiritually. They, they try to look for these things in the world. Love is what makes the world go round, they say. And so they look for these things. And they find them. But these things aren't given from God. They're given from, and they self admittedly say, from ourselves, from the flesh, from nature, not from God. They'll leave God out of the whole situation, right? Glory in the Lord means you glory in the things that God gives. And what he gives is sufficient. What he, what he gives is abundantly above all that you can ask and think. What he gives abounds over anything that, again, the world can offer. But that takes spiritual enlightenment, you understand. When I say that God gives more than the world can offer, you don't understand spiritual things. You're going, how's that? How much money can God make me? Right? How much money do you get from doing that? How much esteem do you get from doing that? Not a lot. Right? Well, then how's that greater glory? Well, that's not the greater glory. The greater glory comes later. You see? Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, is what Paul says in Romans 5, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, it's an eternal weight of glory. That's what we have been promised. The glory in Ephesians 1, look at Ephesians 1, verse 18, the glory of enlightened eyes, that's eyes of understanding, the glory of knowing his calling, and the glory of knowing and having the riches of his inheritance. Ephesians 1, that's what Paul prays for, verse 18. And the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, we covered that already before, that you might know the hope of his calling, we talked about God's will, and that you might... Uh, and that you might uh, know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, the exceeding greatness, great power to usward. You need to be able to communicate and understand and know the power that you've been promised, the hope that you've been given, the glory that you hope for. That's going to be a reality because that's your motivation. Okay. Philippians 3.19, Paul says there are those who glory in the wrong things. They glory in their bellies and thus they glory in their shame. Okay. What's ironic about that is that Paul wrote that from prison. People gloried in their bellies, and they were much better off than Paul. And Paul says they're glorying in their shame. Imagine how that looks. I mean, being in prison is a shameful thing. Paul was in prison, saying these people out of prison who are living comfortably, glorying in their bellies. That's why they're not in prison. That's shameful, right? That sounds mean, doesn't it? I'm not saying be mean. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying it sounds because Paul's in prison. He's calling people outside of prison. Shameful because they're not in prison suffering. They're glorying in their bellies is what he's saying. They're not glorying in the Lord. It doesn't matter if you're in or out of prison. It's what they're glorying in is what he's pointing out. He says, I'd rather be in prison glorying in the Lord than out of prison not glorying in him. That's what he's saying. Right? And he weeps over those who don't because what they're pursuing is so much less than what they could have. You see? In the same way that the world weeps over children in the world who don't have access to healthcare, education, uh, progress uh, as far as a society, and they weep over them. And rightly so. Right? Christians know a greater glory. Why don't we weep over the unsaved who think that they're pursuing the greatest that they can and don't ever get what they could have in Christ? That's what Christians need to do, is understand the balance and the weight of that. 
The glory in Christ is eternal. Colossians 3, 4 says, when the Lord appears in glory, you shall appear with him in glory. Right? What a day that will be. It's not just a hymn sung at church. We're trying to remind ourselves of that greater glory. So look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. So we wrap up here. Five things a Christian should know. How to study the Bible so you can learn about these things. You won't know God's glory any other way. How to know what God wants you to do, His will. How to live, how to walk after the Spirit, which seems to be a big topic of conversation. How to know what's coming. There's a judgment of you coming up. And then how to know the greater glory of God. 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. Was it 1 Timothy 1 verse 10? No, it's this one. He says in verse 10, yeah, yeah, 210. That's right. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That's why he endures all things. Why ought we endure this life? What's the point of this life? The point of this life is that you might know Jesus Christ, the glory that he offers you through salvation by grace for eternity. And Paul says he endures all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ with eternal glory. Glory. It's a faithful saying that if we de are dead with him, we shall live with him. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. But if we believe in not, yet he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. He says in chapter 4, verse 18, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. On his deathbed, Paul writes, the evil works, he's not talking about the present evil works against him that are going to be erased only by his death. And resurrection is all these things that were against me all the things that in this world uh, oppressed me all the tribulations and pain and everything that was against the greater glory are going to be resolved by me dying with Christ and resurrecting in heaven okay because at that point none of those evils none of those pains and sufferings have anything to do with you right that's what Paul says so glorying in Christ, truly in that eternal glory, not in the present, is something that Christianity teaches. Today, it's you only have one life to live. It's be in the present, do things for the now, right? Where's eternity in this? Christians need to know that. All right, we'll stop there. Five things every Christian should know. Has anyone ever told you? I, I told you that that's a good way to minister to people. You can ask them, has anyone ever told you this or that? Because many Christians will respond with the negative. Ask them about the gospel. Has anyone ever told you the gospel? Good question. Because they could say yes, but they might say no if they're honest, oftentimes. So whenever I told you how to live, what is coming, the greater glory of God, this is a good way to minister. Any questions? Any comments? Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for giving us the knowledge of the truth in your word. We thank you for the opportunity to learn these things and for the hope of glory that you've given us according to the mystery. We thank you for giving us the instructions, for giving us the, the, the spirit, and for giving us uh, peace when it comes to our judgment with you, that we stand by faith and not by our works. Amen.